Hi, I hope y'all are enjoying your lunch. Um, we're gonna keep with the enjoying of the lunch and the discussions. Like I hate to pause the discussion, but we're gonna pause it just for a minute and then kick it right back up. So today we're gonna be talking about developing a reflective teaching practice. And for those of you outside of education, especially those of us in the sciences, it might feel a little touchy-feely like reflective teaching and developing a practice, but it's actually just being thoughtful about your teaching, right? And, and being responsive to your students' needs, to changes in the environment, to things like AI, whatever we need to do. So we wanted to start, um, you know me, I'm Allison, the co-director of CTL, but one of your fellow new faculty, Brittany Marshall, is also here because this is some of the stuff that she does. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So my name is Brittany, and I am, like you, a first year uh, tenure track faculty member. I'm in the College of Education and the School of Teacher Education, um, specifically focused on math education. And uh, prior to um, coming here, uh, I have taught for about 15 years. So taught in the K-12 system for about a decade, and then I taught all throughout my PhD program, and I'm teaching now. Um, so one really big thing in education is the idea of reflexivity and um, really thinking about like your practice, your pedagogy, things that work, things that don't work, um, and trying to figure out ways to t uh, fix it. The cool thing about having, I think, a two-two load um, is most likely, hopefully, you're teaching the same thing twice, which is great. So you can be very reflexive and change things very quickly. Um, so like I teach on uh, Monday and Tuesday. So if things don't necessarily go the way I want it to, or if someone made a comment that I think everyone should know, um, on Monday, I know that I can fix it very quickly on Tuesday, um, but some of us may not have that uh, luxury, so there are other ways that we can be reflexive to help our um, teaching. Um, but to start off, we want us to be in pairs or at most a thruple. I just like that word. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, not like groups of five, but like two or three. And we want you to reflect on two, three questions. The first one, is what are two things you're doing right in your class that you feel you're doing right um and if it's one that's fine too like to get the conversation going and then think of one thing that you want to possibly change in your class right now and then the last thing is how do you know whether you're doing that right or something that you want to change so we're giving them five minutes to yeah. discuss that five six minutes depending on the groups. okay and again, the how do you know could just be a gut feeling. Right. Like, right. I did this thing, and it felt really weird, or yeah. it felt really awkward, or no one said anything. Or right. I did this thing, and I felt really nice. Like, it felt warm when I was done. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Or the yeah. students came up. I really enjoyed that. It's like, there's evidence. And yeah. And like, are you getting emails from students saying that this class was dope? You know, whatever. So think of two things that are going really well in your class, you're teaching right now. One thing that... Um, you'd like to change and think about how you know. So you get that. Let's keep them so that everyone has a chance to share. Right. Remember, we're in groups of two or three. Share it. Okay. Um, so let's, are you all ready to debrief? Let's talk uh, some things through. Um, Luca, I know, made a point in his um, group, and I was wondering if he wanted to share it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure, something that I noticed that works at least in my class is that after the midterm, it didn't go as well as I wanted it to be. So I sent out an anonymous survey for the students so they could write anything they felt about the class. And surprisingly, there were no mean comments, but some of them like asked for more like practice problems mm -hmm. or examples. So I was able to like kind of like correct the path for like the rest of the class. So. I'm gonna do it again for next week or next next week. So we'll yeah, see. really cool. It, did anyone else want to share out something that they're noticing? <laughs> oh, um, I was just discussing some of the things that are not going well. Kind of when you have a book or curriculum set by the department, you don't particularly like, um, and limited ability to change is like how to navigate um, kind of agreeing with some of your students' criticism and how to like adjust when you have so much power to adjust it. Yeah. 
limits. And that goes back to sort of that transparency we've been talking about this whole time. So sometimes there are limits imposed, but you can be honest with your students about that. Like we have to do this, or this was given to us. Right? Especially in programs where you have to get hours, so like nursing or some of our engineering programs, it's like we have to do these things or your degree won't matter. Right. Because it won't be an accredited program, right? So sometimes you sort of let them know that this is coming from outside. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of connect it to but, right? ABET thinks this is important because, and here's why we're learning it, engineer, 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 <laughs> right? Yeah. Other stuff. Um, I'll say for me, my graduate students are not good at asking questions. We're not in the practice of asking questions and I'm talking with my, my partner. I think I realized like I'm not good at making them ask questions. I'm good at giving them a choice okay. that among three things you could do, one of them could be ask a question, but mm -hmm. they don't choose that. Mm -hmm. And so there's this tension between like I want to be able to uh, authentically assess the <coughs> things that matter to them. Mm -hmm. But like what matters to me is asking questions and they're not choosing that. And so yeah. I haven't like hit the right design note yet. Yeah. And I want to change that. All right. So this goes back to sort of a larger reflective teaching practice, right? And I'm a scientist. We like models and charts that demonstrate our models. So really, this is sort of the cyclical process that keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. So if we could take a snapshot of it, right? As instructors, we do something, we teach something, and then we observe data from different sources. And that can be what our students are doing or what they're not doing, mm -hmm. right? Um, it can also be feedback that you're getting, and that can be what you solicit from them, what the university solicits from them. It can be what you're hearing naturally, organically in the conversation. Um, I heard two students at GMCS yesterday, I was walking in, and one was approaching one, and they were like, dude, it was only office hours. And the one was like, what? And the third was like, seriously, I could have slept in, and I'm watching this unfold, and I'm like, okay, so what I think had happened was <laughs> students went to the class expecting a class. It wasn't a class, it was office hours, and all of them are really pissed off because expectations were not met. And I'm like, oh, and I thought to myself, as a faculty member, if I'm having an optional student office hour, or if it's a required student, like, right, I'm an, it's an office hour, but I'm there to answer questions. I want to be really transparent about what this day is and what they should be expecting from it so that if that student wants to sleep, that student can choose to sleep or not, right? I want them all to choose my class. But sometimes that's not the choices they make, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're going to get this feedback from a number of different sources. Students, you can ask each other for feedback, and that's part of why we do these think pair shares here, because some of you have a lot of teaching experience, some of you have very limited teaching experience, some of you, right, you have experience teaching somewhere else, and then you get here and you're like, whoa, maybe this isn't like mm -hmm. my students in my last institution. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of self-reflection. I love that you sort of, I want them to ask questions, but I'm giving them options, and they're not picking the option that I want them to pick. Mm -hmm. It's like you own that part of it when you're giving them these choices and they choose the thing you don't want them to choose. You're like, how about you choose A? And they're like, B and C. And you're like, but A! And you're like, B and C. And you're like, oh, maybe in one of your things going forward, the whole thing is just asking a. questions and you're not giving them B or C, right? right? And then we have literature. So almost all of our fields have pedagogical scholarship of teaching and learning generally, but also scholarship of teaching and learning very specifically. We have two math educators trained in educating math. <laughs> it's a very niche right. field. It's not education, it's not math, it's math education. <laughs> very specific. So once we get this data, then we want to reflect on the data, right? And then plan, make a change, implement those changes. And so I don't really want to spend a ton of time on the slides. I want to give us time to talk about these things, but just sort of racing through. We know that we're going to get student feedback. At the end of the semester, we've got Explorance Blue, which is our student feedback survey. We stopped calling them student evaluations. That sounds really rigid. Student opinions, that's good because it is their opinion of us. But for our bargaining agreement, we have to give them a voice and we have to use that voice in our RTP process. It's hopelessly biased and flawed. Asterisk right there, right? But you get it at the end of the semester. It's really good for making changes to the next semester. It does nothing for you now. Mm -hmm. Right? And there's so many things that go into that. Like, there's a fun teaching of psychology journal article where someone gave students chocolate before the evaluation. 
the students that were randomly given chocolate. It's called Fudging the Numbers. I'll post it That's on the Canvas cute. site. And it was like, oh, could you guys do me a favor? Of, my kid had all this candy. Just take the candy. It wasn't like I'm giving it to you for this purpose. But all of their evals went up from a piece of chocolate. <laughs> Doesn't mean you go out and buy chocolate for all your students. But I like to bring this into my class to be like, if I gave you all chocolate, maybe some of you would like me more. It has nothing to do with anything, right? So we can't go back in time we fix. We can do things to boost the response rate, like giving them time in class, explaining to them what it is and how to do it. Not what to say, right? But explaining to them, this is my way of getting feedback. And so if you say, you're awesome. Well, that feels good, but I don't know what I did that was awesome. If you say, you suck. Okay, that's not good, but I don't know what I did. You need to be specific and clear, right? And when I teach research methods, I like to use the language of our field. I'm like, operationally define, suck. Operationally define, awesome. Like, what does that mean to you in this class? And then you'll get more feedback. Hopelessly biased. Um, Chronicle, it seems like Chronicle is on pace with our new faculty success program. Every time I go to put something on here, Chronicle is doing something. So there were um, a couple of people who are very aware of all the biased research, all the bias within student evaluations. And so they went into it head first thinking we're gonna combat this and they failed miserably. <laughs> which just goes to show there's a lot of stuff going on, some of which we can't fix. But some of which, right, you can kind of address head on, eh, and then you talk about it in your narrative. What's really good is the mid-semester feedback. So it's kind of what Luca was talking about. What some of us have talked about with like um, exam wrappers. So if you want feedback around a thing you did in your class, here's the exam, how did it go? Here's the first paper, how did it go? Or we're halfway through the class, how is it going? Great for making changes in class, right? Great for being responsive to your needs. And if you're responding to your needs throughout the semester, they're gonna really appreciate and love you at the end of the semester. Right? Um, it may help with those evaluations at the end. We have some examples. So I posted Brittany's and I posted mine, and there are two different ways of doing it. Mine has two questions. Yours, I think, had five or six. It wasn't very long. But just two examples of ways that you can roll this out now if you haven't already solicited feedback, right? Things like Canvas quiz or a Google Doc or a Google mm -hmm. Form, lots of different ways that you can grab it. So a couple of things I wanted to make sure with, we talked about the end of the semester, student opinion surveys. Um, those are like people of color, women, if you talk about race or any kind of forms of oppression or things like that in your class, the chances of you having lower um, student evaluations are real, right? So um, I know when I was a <laughs> doc student teaching my classes, I never read my student evaluations at the end of the course I never read them um, but you know once I started to plan for jobs I realized I had higher scores than I know so that was good <laughs> but I did want to say for mid-semester uh, feedback um, don't give it if you're not going to do anything with it the same thing with the things that we ask our students to do um, if what you're asking your students to do isn't helpful for them or you're not going to grade it don't give it right so the same thing with mid-semester feedback like give it with the intent that you will change and adopt your pedagogy for your students. Um, I say this saying that I gave my mid-semester feedback and I had a rough day on Monday night when I read the, ref uh, the feedback. So um, it was anonymous and it was uh, anonymous optional and it was, um, the, uh, they didn't have to do it. All of it was optional. And uh, I have 66 students, 10 filled it out, um, Seven or eight were like, oh my God, this class is amazing. I love you all. I kind of struck in my ego feeling good. Um, a few people, though, gave me a lot of feedback on, um, uh, we watch a lot of videos of children learning math. Um, they thought they were redundant and asked me to put them online. Um, and I uh, made sure I specifically addressed that the very next day in class, like explaining why I do the videos. I thought I made it clear, but I guess I hadn't. And I really scaled back the amount of uh, videos that I show. They also told me that sometimes my assignments aren't as clear as they could be. I agree with them. So that was something I wanted to address right away. Now, I did get one that said, she thinks she's funny and she's not. <laughs> that went all the way in on me. That is objectively and I was so, false. I was so upset and hurt. So I'm also telling you, give this 
and try to have a thick skin, the chances of you getting ate up are pretty <laughs> And like, but then I also had to remember one of my friends told me that just like this person felt the need to say all of that negative stuff about you, all of these other people felt the need to, you know, say how great you are. And all of it was optional. So they didn't have to say anything either. So um, it's all data points, right? And use them. Like maybe there's some truth in me thinking I'm funny. Even though most of the class thinks I'm funny, somebody probably does it, you know? And so maybe that's that's for something for me to reflect on, right? Um, just like everything else. So again, when we do uh, mid-semester feedbacks, try to make them short, um, like something that they can do very quickly. But also, uh, it shouldn't be something that's a waste of their time. Like, you know, really take the feedback and try to do, like, change and adjust your class for it. And sometimes that change is not big. It's right. just being more clear or more communicative because yeah. we know what we're doing and we think that we're telling them. Even the most transparent of us are like, well, I told them that. Yeah. But maybe they weren't hearing it or they weren't, right, they weren't getting what you wanted them to get. They were hearing something else. And so right. sometimes it's just a matter of taking the feedback and telling them, I hear you. I see you. There's a whole research on mm -hmm. mattering. Yeah. Students need to feel that they matter and that their voices matter in this process. And along with that, um, when you give the feedback, um, when you start to implement it, I highly suggest the very next day, like day of class, whenever you say it's due, the very next class period, coming in and letting them know that you read it, the feedback, whether that's going to show like a quick slide of like prominent things that they said or just saying it out loud because again it shows that they matter yep. so being clear like letting them know a lot of people said this okay i got you a lot of people said this or even one person said this and i thought it was helpful for everyone being very like transparent that way is really helpful yeah my grad my grad class on tuesday they gave me anonymous feedback and one was like I really like the lecture so I don't want to get rid of that because it's important information but like I wish we had more time to discuss it so it was like okay slide 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 and then I sat and for an hour we chatted and then it was like I kept pointing to a slide that wasn't there it was like, oh on slide three this and oh on slide five this and we all just sort of got to chat it chatted out a bit and it was and they were like thanks this yeah. was fun I'm like okay but you want to be transparent in how you're responding to them because if you're just like oh I'm gonna be super stealth and ninja and sneaky about like no then they won't know that you did any changes right, right? Yeah. tell them you said this I'm responding to you with that and they will they will Absolutely. go with you interpreting it so Brittany sort of already talked about this, but we've got the quantitative at the end of the semester survey, or how you do your semester or your mid semester eval. If you've got numbers and words, look at the quantitative data, the means, the range, the outliers. So you can see, and Explorance Blue is really weird in that they have like a does not apply option, but if you're not reading it the right way, it looks like favorable, favorable, awful, and it's not awful. It's like the does not apply is sitting right below the like everything is terrible in this class. And mm. so you really want to be careful when you're reading it. <laughs> For the people who aren't numbers people, right? You be careful reading it because you might be reading it incorrectly. Mm. Um, and again, with mean and outliers, if you've got 10 people filling out a survey and two people don't like you, it's going to look like no one likes you, right? Mm -hmm. As a, I love your example of how many three-pointers LeBron has made or missed and contextualizing those numbers, mm -hmm. it's really important, mm -hmm. right? Can you please share that before you put that in your mouth? Like, mm -hmm. I love that example. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I was, so I was teaching students about how to like properly evaluate, analyze data within the proper context. So I asked students, guess how many shots Steph Curry has missed? Like how many three-point shots Steph Curry has missed? And turns out he's missed 5,000 shots mm -hmm. over his career. Guess how many three-point shots I've missed in my career going back to high school? Probably less than 500. So does that make me a better basketball player? Right, right. <laughs> no. Some of them said yes. Some of them said I can get my NBA contract. <laughs> but some of them were like, wait, 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 right? You have to understand what it is you're looking at. So looking at how big your class is, but how many people filled it out? All of that is on there. Mm -hmm. The qualitative data, look for themes and trends. I say this until I'm blue in the face, which is ironic given our thing is called Explorance Blue. Because every time I'll get someone who finds one comment from one student, and that's the only comment they can see. I was hurt, y'all. 
Psychologically, we've got something called the negativity bias. We focus on negative. That is how we are built. So I'm not funny. Ow. Oh. No. She thinks she's funny. Oh, I don't think I'm funny. I am funny, right? Like that cuts to the core. Um, and this is where CTL gets requests for, right? Peer consultation and feedback. It's like, uh, can you help me with my evals? Because I'm freaking out. And then I'm looking at them and I'm like, I mean, that one comment was not nice. And that one comment was a little weird. But two comments in 80 comments, like if I'm a reviewer for RTP, I'm not stuck on those. I know that you are, I appreciate that. But I'm not looking at those to pick those out for you, right? But let's let's reflect on this. So don't get stuck on the single comments. Look for trends. And I do this when I do RTP for tenure and tenure track promotions and reappointments. I also do this for lecturer reviews, right? If I see one thing that's like, uh, so-and-so is a little scattered, so-and-so tells stories and goes off on tangents, so-and-so never sticks with the schedule, so-and-so we can't ever predict when, then I'm looking at like, huh, that's a theme of like disorganized lack of time management. Right. <laughs> maybe we can root that like, maybe you could be reflective on how you're managing time and how you're presenting information or be a little more consistent with your proposed syllabus schedule. Right, instead of just willy-nilly throwing tests around whenever they, they feel like it. Mm -hmm. But then with all of this, with the mid-semester and with the end of the semester, you have to figure out when to reflect, when to act, and when to move on. Because those are three very different sort of journeys that you can mm -hmm. take on this choose-your-own-adventure for evaluations. There are actionable items. There are non-actionable items, right? And then there's just error. As all people who deal with data know, there are errors, right? I had a mid-semester evaluation comments like, be really helpful if you gave us study guides. <laughs> I'm sorry, I do. They're pretty good. We've been talking about this for three weeks, three times a week, to where like Charles here in the front row is like, yeah, I know. What? what? I'm like, but okay. So I just kind of laughed and was like, mm, mm. okay, I'm good. Mm. I'm gonna move on from that. But if I could put the comment back to that student, it's like, I did have study guys, right? It's, it's an error. So all of this process, you wanna kind of take and keep notes. Like I print out a physical copy of my syllabus when I have a class that I'm teaching, and I take notes in the margins and circle what worked, what didn't work, what we needed more time on, what we need to continue on. Sometimes it's like, well, I only got to slide five, so when we pick up, I've gotta pick up there. But I'd make these modifications so that when I'm building my syllabus the next semester, I know to make those adjustments, or at least to be aware of when those adjustments need to be made, and when I can help make this better for the next batch of students. Um, I just started making my um, syllabus in Google Docs, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I share a link with my students, and they know that the syllabus is subject to change, so like they don't have a physical, you know, printed out one, and they're able to see the changes as need be. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, like when I realize they're stuck on a subject, we stay on it for an extra week, and they'll see it change in real time. But also, it allows me to put, um, you know, notes, uh, you know, uh, yeah, comments on the mm -hmm. side of things that I want to. Um, make sure I think about next year and things like that. Yeah. So on top of the students, we can also ask each other for feedback. And this is where CTL comes in. Um, we have, I have a link to it on the Canvas site. You can ask for classroom observations. You can ask for consultations. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. So it can be within your field, right? A psychologist knows what I'm teaching and they can talk about not only my teaching and my style of teaching, but like, the accuracy of what I'm saying <laughs> that's important. Um, but I can get someone from outside of my field. So when I went up for promotion to full, um, I had the CTL director at the time come in, who's an English person. It's not, it's not from psychology, but he could come in and look at how I'm teaching, right? I love to use engineering as examples because like we have, right, aerospace engineering. I'm like, they're literal rocket scientists. I have no idea what they're saying. <laughs> I, I, I'm so confused. But I can see that what they're saying is resonating with students. I can see students who are nodding and engaging. I can see students who are confused or are responding in real time. I can see that unfold without having to know anything about the topic of the class. So you can talk about shared knowledge. You can comment on field specificity. Or you can talk uh, just general about teaching styles. And you want to look in your RTP, your policy file for your 
department or your school and your college to see if you need a teaching observation. Some of them do, some of them do not in order to go up, but if it's positive, it's almost always gonna help your case even if it's not required. Yeah. So there's a full professor in the um, College of Education. She's in um, math education too. Her name is uh, Lisa. Oh, no, Lisa Lamb. Lisa yeah. Lamb. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, an email was sent to us last month yep. saying that she would be a um, peer reviewer if he wanted one. Mm -hmm. And she goes. She does these affirming conversations. Yeah, she does them all over the um, university. Um, she's just a master teacher. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, I know she her information is listed in the. Um, the one bulletin. of the CTL yeah, yeah. bulletins. I highly suggest, whether it's her or someone else, especially if you're a new teacher, highly, highly suggest having someone come in and observe your teaching. Like, you learn so, so much. I know um, one of the um, things we sent you all may have talked about, like having videos and things like that of your teaching. That can be very daunting. I had to do that, like, for my, you know, certification, record myself teach and you know, even kids give us smart answers and stuff like whatever. But um, that can be daunting. I don't think it's as helpful though as having a person in the come in the classroom and kind of just let you know like where you stand, who you seem to be talking to, as opposed to people who are being possibly ignored in the class. And these are things you may not even notice that you do. Um, it's just really, really helpful and I highly suggest it. Yeah. Those are the affirming conversations, and those are 10-minute snapshots. That's all Lisa goes in for. Um, and those are really helpful because they're, they're called affirming conversations. She goes in looking for good mm -hmm. and finding good and telling you about good. There's nothing negative about it. You can look at a holistic evaluation. So we do sort of, DJ calls it the soup to nuts, where I will talk to you. You'll give me your syllabus. We'll figure out which day I'm coming to class. I watch you do you in class, and then I come back. I write an evaluation, and we sort of debrief we pre-brief we do we debrief so that I'm sort of understanding what that class is as a part of your class as a part of you as a teacher um, and then sometimes it's just evaluating a specific thing you want eyes on a syllabus you want eyes on a rubric you want eyes on something something isn't working and you want to talk about how or why it's not working with other people who might have comments right so you can get all this feedback here but none of it does any good if you don't sit and think with it you have to reflect on it all of it um, and not all of it all the time, put it away, but you want to notice your successes. When someone gives you a compliment and says that they really enjoyed this, that's fine, great, keep that, right? If something doesn't work, keep that so you know not to do it again, right? And save everything. So whenever you go for a guest lecture here or you're talking to someone there or someone's asking you to come speak, save those requests, save the will you please come do this, save the thank you for doing it, because you don't know what you're gonna need for your teaching file for RTP, and there's nothing worse than like, you remember that time I came to your class four years ago? <laughs> Could you write me an email thanking me for that <laughs> now? It's kind of weird, right? And so you just save, but you can on you know the marvel the marvels of Gmail, you can say teaching file service file like saved stuff. I have things that's like College of Science stuff, psych stuff, nonsense stuff, <coughs> stuff stuff, I, whatever it is. <laughs> There's teaching development, you can read about how to be a better teacher. Um, and, right, CTL, CIE, we offer lots of programming on ways to sort of tool yourself up. And then your teaching statement, it's fun. I, I was just talking to my grad students about this. A lot of them haven't started thinking about a teaching statement yet, so I have a little asterisk like, we will get to that later, but y'all had to write a teaching statement to get here and so you know don't sit and reflect on it each, each semester but like in year two or three when you're going up for periodic evaluation or you know retention you want to see like are you doing what you said you're doing have things changed what is what is happening and where's the evidence for that because teaching is always an evolution there's nothing static about teaching and when you are static in your teaching you become an ineffective teacher i love hearing students who are like yeah, I had Dr. So-and-so's test. It had 1992 written on it. And I'm like, and they're like, dude, I wasn't even born then. And I was like, true. That's a really old test also. Something has happened in our field since then. Like, there should be some updates, right? And this is where we'll sort of leave, is on the Canvas site, we've got this to sort of walk through for anyone watching the video who wasn't here. You've got the, I'll post the slides when we get the video back from ITS that usually comes on Monday. But we have stuff for, for you to start thinking about the teaching section of your RTP file. 
right? Um, most of you will not have to go up for periodic evaluation until year two, and then the third year is a retention where you're trying to get retained, right? And then four or five are periodic, and then six is promotion and tenure. You have a two-page narrative right now in teaching, so you get two pages, yeah, single space, it's lovely. You have to distinguish five significant items, and they have to be distinct items. Oftentimes it's the class that you created, it's an assignment that you've made for a class, it can be a student that you're mentoring in a thesis or a dissertation project, some kind of something that you're doing. So if you go through the Course Design Institute from ITS and you learn how to put a course that's completely not online to completely online for a summer session, that is a thing, that's a teaching significant item. What we're hoping for in your evaluation is for those of you who are actively engaging with the new Faculty Success Program, when you finish it up in two weeks when we're done with our last one, we will have this badge that we can give you and that can be one of your teaching significant items for the periodic evaluation. Like here's what I'm doing, here's the stuff that I'm doing towards teaching. You also have to turn in a course list, so there's a template, right, you, things like that. Um, with that you turn in a syllabus, major and minor assessments, student opinion surveys, maybe a peer observation if it's a part of your file, a list of student theses and mentoring, so if you're in a field where you don't do that, that doesn't get included, but for those of us in the sciences where we are doing right master's thesis supervision, we've got a list of those. But this links to the RTP file, and there's lots of information there. There will be lots of workshops that you will have the opportunity to go to. There's a lot of stuff online, so it's not, it might feel like a daunting process, but we just want to sort of, there is this thing, you have to teach, it's number one in the file, but this is why we want you to think about reflectively teaching, developing a reflective teaching program so that you will be ready for all of this. It will just come naturally. The, the two-pager will write itself. You'll have five things that are easy. You'll be like, oh, that part of the file is already done. That's where we want to get to. Questions, comments? This is a good time for discussion. Yes? Yeah, can I add something? Uh, so I, I didn't go to sleep until 3.30 a.m. Oh my. Night because I was finishing up my RTP letters, shares letters. Mm -hmm. They are due today. Yes. Yeah, so I so I, I totally agree with you that sometimes we get some kind of uh, more negative feedback from mm -hmm. our students. Um, and then I think most chairs or the RTP community members are reasonable enough not to need to get those one or two negative ones. Yeah. However, um, some do. We do look over time, so mm -hmm. if those negative ones are kind of consistent yep. over time, then those are that's easily caught yep. by the reviewers or the viewers. So yeah. that's something that I would like to add. I like that. I appreciate that. So you know, if you have one or two negative comments, one or two negative comments, one or two negative comments over the course of a semester, across semesters, across years, you will start getting that trend, and so you want to sort of. Uh, to address that, to deal with that. But oftentimes you'll get a couple of comments, something a little bit negative, and then reflect. If you don't wanna to come to CTL, reflect with someone in your department, someone outside of your department, your chair, your dean, and then document how you're going to do that, right? I had someone who asked, here's my weird comments, and I'm like, okay. They're like, could I record this session? I'm like, why? Like, what? I don't want you Zoom recording me talking about what, what, like, and so I was like, just wondering the motivation behind that, like <laughs> awkward, I don't want to be recorded, but this person was worried about, well, if this comic gets stuck in my file, can I show that I went to CTL and I'm trying to deal with it? I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, so you can show the email, we don't have to record this, that's not necessary, but the person's mind was in the right place, right? They wanted to show that they were being responsive, that they were kind of practicing that reflexivity, like, here, I got some negative feedback. I am actively dealing with it. So that's not wrong. Other questions, comments? Yes, um, Valeria. So I did have my nature survey, anonymous feedback survey. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it went a lot better than what I was expecting. OK, good. Um, and so I did take notes of all the positive feedback. But one negative feedback was really not about me, was more about their interest in the class. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how to address it. Like this one student said, like the question was something like, what the instructor could do to improve your learning experience? Mm -hmm. They just said something like, nothing. I'm just not interested in the material. 
Yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, for that, you can't do anything so with that. Clearly, for that student, this is a required course. Yep. And I'm like, but if this is a core course of your major, why did you even choose this major? So I'm like, I don't know, like, why are they not interested? These are big, what big, big questions. Like, what can I do when I get that? Here, so I yeah, um, <laughs> with those ones they're tough because especially if it is a required course, I think it's our job when we're talking way back to the first meeting of like personal relevance and showing why this is important, right? Um, you've got to show the purpose and the relevance of your course. And so some students, they might not enjoy it, but they're like, eh, psychology is a good example. All of them have to take research methods. 85% of them don't want to take research methods. But at the end of research methods, they're like, I get that someone needs to do that so that we know all of this, right? But I'm like, I don't want to be here. I'm only here because it's required. I can't do anything else with that. My job is just to try to show them why this is important. Why if anyone gets a bachelor's degree in psychology in any kind of, in any kind of program, that research methods are covered because people need to understand the science behind our field because it's not fluff. There's actual science behind it, and this is the methods that we use in our science, right? So I've got to get that across, but if they're like, I don't care that this is required, I still don't like it, and you can't win them all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I really try hard to spark their interest, like giving them real world examples that I think are relevant to them mm -hmm. nowadays. Like the other day, I gave them a autonomous vehicle driving example. I'm like, this should be cool for you guys, not me. Everyone is talking about it. But I still don't know if it catches them all, or someone might just not yeah. be. Someone might just, and you can't, right? We talk about things like DFW rates. I don't think we're ever going to get to zero. I don't think we should get to zero if people are actually earning Ds and Fs and are withdrawing from classes. So you have to sort of get back to what are your learning outcomes? What's the point? recognizing you've got a distribution of students, right? If you had one student in your class and that one student was not interested, I would be very concerned for you. But one not really being interested is not, I can see that it's, yeah. it's weighing on you, but I would kind of take it and that would be the non-actionable. I would put that into the non-actionable category. Like I can try, maybe I can ask that student what they're interested in and look for an example that that student might be interested in, but you could be doing all of this work and at the end of the semester that student still might not be interested in that class. Okay. Which is fine. DJ. So on the side to this very question is that CTL and faculty advancement more generally are talking about this same, these same questions to chairs and directors and people who evaluate faculty yep. student feedback. So we're talking with them about what do you do when you see one strongly personal negative statements in a class of 85. What do you do if you see a trend? And why have we stopped calling the thing we used to call student evaluations and started calling it student feedback? So we're talking to chairs and directors about how this is not particularly reliable data. It's often personal and biased. Students who are getting A's and students who are getting D's and F's tend to fill them out at higher rates than students who are having a more mid experience in the class. So exactly to your question, we are finding opportunities to talk to chairs and directors about how to evaluate this survey data when it comes back in. So it isn't like, aha, one student said this thing, therefore I will make a decision based on this one piece of unreliable, probably biased data. So that conversation is happening on the other side of this relationship. Yeah. Are we able to adjust the time frame of um, the student evaluations? Um, At the end so of the semester? Yeah. Yeah. Those are given by the university. And they have, they have adjusted them in the past. They used to give them sort of when finals weeks opened, when it started, and it was open the whole week of finals week. Yes. And then their grades were sort of held hostage from them. So if I inputted a grade and they gave me feedback, then it would magically show them their grade. But all grades get released and then they realize, hey, that's kind of coercive. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we should, like, so, and then they realize that when you're giving evaluations during finals, it's totally confounded with finals. So they give it way before that. Yes. But some of them are kind of holding out their opinion to see how it goes. And we're, we're getting them when they're anxious yeah, anyway. Like, like my previous institution, mm -hmm. like my very first semester, I didn't touch anything. I went with the universities 
guidelines. And you know, a lot of, and I can track when students started responding. If they're responding, you know, during, I mean, I can tell sort of like, really, the students who are responding during finals week were under the stress of, you know, because they, they yep. finally realize that, oh, they have to pass this class and they can't, and then a lot of things get yep. back. Uh, but uh, the other semesters, if I finished it right before finals, um, the feedback was a lot more mm -hmm. reasonably distributed. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And this is where conversations are, like ITS and faculty advancement in consultation with CTL and CIE. We're all trying to figure this out. Sort of the problem is that we have to give them per our bargaining agreement, but there's a whole bunch of like when, how, what should it look like, and it's just never perfect. It's never going to be even close to perfect. So. Comments were never, they, the comments didn't go in the RTP, only the numbers. Yeah. Like there were two versions, two reports. Yeah. Only. And ours are two, and you kind of download the, or actually, no, this one is now like down, it's like bar graphs and pie charts, and then comments, yes. and then more bar graphs and pie charts. It's sort of a, a hodgepodge mess. Um, but they all go into your file. Um, but I also tell my students when I give them, here's the reason, here's what I'm trying to get from it. You remember the mid-semester thing that I gave you? This is at the end, so how did we do the whole way through so that we can do this again? Like, I can make this class better and better and better, but also, there are real human beings reading these. And I think you need to remind them of that. Like, I am reading this, and this is about my class and me, and so keep it civil, right? My chair and my dean will be reading these, and so keep it civil. If it's nothing, I get the anonymous side of it, but some of it, like the anonymity, breeds in civility. Like the stuff that I've read in people's comments, I'm like, oh, yeah. would you dare say that out loud? No, then why are you writing in an email? Like, yeah. yes. And then some of them are just error, you know? I get some that are like, Dr. Hopkins, and I'm like, who's, that's not even me. Like, but they're getting all of them. And so if there is a student who's in theater, TV, and film, and a student in psych, they're, they're they're filling it out when they're all freaked out and they're getting it wrong and I'm like, well, maybe I should go give this to so-and-so because it's clearly about their class because it's talking about things that don't matter. <laughs>